and welcome to the Free Church at Hampstead Garden Suburb as we share together in this short act of evening worship. It will include a celebration of communion and so please have to hand bread and wine or that which can serve as bread and wine so that when we come to the appropriate moment we will be able to share one with another and in our sharing we will become all one in Christ. We're going to commend this time to God. We're going to pray. Let's pray together. And we give you thanks, O oh God, for this opportunity of meeting to share together in worship, for this opportunity to open our hearts to you, to say thank you, for all the good things that we have enjoyed during this day and indeed in days gone by. We thank you for every blessing that has been ours to know. You have blessed us in abundance and we have much to be thankful for. We thank you in particular for Jesus, your Son, who has become for us Saviour and Lord, the one whom you gave that we might receive the one whose life was sacrificed that we might live the one who overcame even death that we might live forever in your presence we thank you too for the Holy Spirit the one who is with us every moment of every day and who is forever making us aware of the truth concerning your love for us in Christ. We offer you this short act of worship. We ask your blessing upon it. We look to your spirit that he might inspire it. And in the midst of it all, may we have that sense of being at one with you as surely as we are at one with each other. Do this we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And so a reading from John's Gospel in chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, and verse 1. The words of Jesus. In very truth I tell you, the man who does not enter the sheepfold by the door who climbs in some other way, is nothing but a thief and a robber. He who enters by the door is the shepherd in charge of the sheep. The doorkeeper admits him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow, because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. This was a parable that Jesus told them, but they did not understand what he meant by it. So Jesus spoke again, In very truth I tell you, I am the door of the sheepfold. The sheep paid no heed to any who came before me, for they were all thieves and robbers. I am the door. Anyone who comes into the fold through me will be safe. He will go in and out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and may have it in all its fullness. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, when he sees the wolf coming, abandons the sheep and runs away, because he is not the shepherd and the sheep are not his. Then the wolf harries the flock and scatters the sheep. The man runs away because he is a hired man and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. But there are other sheep of mine not belonging to this fold. I must listen to them as well, and they too will listen to my voice. 
there will then be one flock, one shepherd. The Father loves me because I lay down my life to receive it back again. No one takes it away from me. I am laying it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to receive it back again. This charge I have received from my Father. These words once again caused a division among the Jews. Many of them said, He is possessed, he is out of his mind, why listen to him? Others said, No one possessed by a demon could speak like this. And we thank God for his word. Which, for this evening, I leave with you. And let it speak for itself, that you might understand it directly. But just for a few moments, I want to talk about something else. We've all been enjoying the Olympic Games from Japan, even without crowds in the stadium. Still, it's been an exciting adventure. We've enjoyed so much of it. We've been thrilled by the exploits of the sportsmen and women. As a country, we've done well. Gold, silver, bronze, medals in abundance. Some we expected, some most unexpected. And even when not watching our own, we've marvelled at the exploits of those from other countries. We've been introduced to sports that we knew little about. All of a sudden, we've become experts when before we had no knowledge at all. People who would otherwise be strangers to us have become household names. It's cheered us up no end. We're grateful. But this weekend must have been difficult for the people of Japan, hosting a world event, welcoming the world, inviting the world in. And yet there will be those living in that country, they're old now, who will hark back to events 76 years ago. It was 76 years ago this weekend, firstly on August the 6th and then on August the 9th, that atomic weapons were used, exploded over Hiroshima and then over Nagasaki. Tens, even hundreds of thousands of people killed in a moment the vast majority of whom were civilians, men, women and children, none of whom were directly involved in the conflict. Awful display. Awesome display. It's a difficult dilemma. I have in my own congregation folk who lived through the war and experienced the horrors of what went on in the Far East and they will tell me that the use of atomic weapons in the way they were used shortened the war. It meant that even though many lives were lost over those few days many more lives would have been lost over the next days, weeks, months, perhaps even years. It hastened the end of the war. Well, that's an ethical dilemma we can turn over in our minds. We're not quite sure. All we know is it was on that weekend that we had revealed to us the capacity that we have for destroying ourselves. And in the intervening years, these weapons of 
mass destruction, as we might describe them, have become even more terrible. If they were to be used today, they would wreak even more havoc, cause even more death and destruction than even happened then. What is our response as Christians? How do we respond to the fact of what happened then and what could still happen now? We cannot undo the past. We cannot revisit events. We cannot change the course of history. What happened, happened. We have it on our conscience. And we are mindful that because we are human, it could happen again. In spite of our best intentions, in spite of a desire to live at peace one with another, there is always the threat that the default position for any one nation is to go to war. And for as long as these weapons are available, there is that hint of fear. So there is no easy answer. All we can do as Christians is identify the fact that there is another way, a different way. A narrow way, a way less travelled by. A way that, if we were prepared to step out on it, would banish forever such fear. It may be too much to ask in this generation, as in any generation. But at the very least we can ask the question. We can offer the alternative. We can dare people to think differently. And we can pray for peace. Peace in our time, peace in all time. Peace forever. But most particularly, we can remember before God those who now are of great age, who survived the horrors of that weekend in 1945, who may still bear in their bodies the scars of those events, who may still be traumatised emotionally, living with the nightmare that was that day. We can commend them to God and pray that in the midst of all their continued suffering, something of the love God has for them, something of the love God has for us, will find its way into their hearts. The one thing we can do is to promise never to forget, always have in mind what was done then what we are capable of now and that for our own good. It is in that spirit that we come to share in communion. Jesus was intent on ensuring that a way should be found by which his people, his followers, the church, should not forget him and all he said and did, that there should be that available to them which would allow them to call to mind the enduring significance of his life, his death and his resurrection. And so he instituted this communion. And it's that in which we share now. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, 
reminds us of how it came to be at the heart of Christian worship. For the tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. A way of being reminded of the enduring significance of Jesus' death, without which we would always and forever be estranged from God, but because of which now we are reconciled to him. As then, so now we give thanks to God for what we are about to share. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for bread and wine, more specifically for that which it represents to us, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray your blessing on this simple act of sharing, when as we eat and drink together, we trust that in the power of your Spirit we will have called to mind the enduring significance of what was accomplished on our behalf at Calvary. We thank you for this most sublime demonstration of your love, a love which knows no limit, which goes beyond whatever any of us might imagine. A love so deep, so wide, so profound. We cannot fathom it. All we can do is say thank you for it. Thank you too that that of which we speak is not in vain. That this Jesus, whose death we commemorate in this act of sharing, this same Jesus you raised from the dead, to remind us that though he died, yet he lives. And that we too, we who are prepared to die to sin for his name's sake, will be raised to newness of life with him. We thank you that what was a last supper has become for us the Lord's Supper. To that end, bless us, we pray, and do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And so, after giving thanks to God, he took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. We take hold of that which is for us the bread, and we eat it, reminding ourselves that we have a personal relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in memory of me. We take hold of the wine. We pause for a moment until we are all ready. And then we drink together, reminding ourselves that wherever we might be, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And we make our prayerful response. In just one simple prayer, we commend to God the people of Japan, Japan of 2021, acknowledging that the shadow of 1945 is still cast across that country. We remember before God 
those still affected by the events of those momentous days all those years ago. We thank you too for that which has grown up out of the ruins. Cities rebuilt, a nation reconstructed, a people reborn. We thank you, O oh God, that today Japan takes its place amongst the family of the nations, working constructively with others to further the cause of world peace. We realise, O oh God, that nothing can undo the awfulness of what happened on the 6th and the 9th of August 1945. For our part in it, we say sorry. Ask your forgiveness, your forbearance. All we can do is in the light of what happened then, pledge ourselves to plant our footsteps firmly in those left behind for us by the Prince of Peace, even our Lord Jesus. Amen. So thank you for joining me for this short service. We will be here again at the same time next Sunday evening. But until then, may God bless us all.